Hi, this is Mr. Adams from Midwood High School, and uh, this is a brief video on four bonding types. Um, we have a quiz coming up soon, and we also have a test on Wednesday, so hopefully this will be a help. Um, the bonding types we'll be looking at will be ionic, covalent, metallic, and network. And just as a reminder, the test is Wednesday, will be on the periodic table and on bonding folks. So we need to, need, we need to know those both of those topics. Okay, uh, moving on. Ionic bonding. Um, classically, ionic bonding is formed by transfer of electrons. We've discussed ionic bonding before in class. We need to review that. Um, we've discussed the topic of valence electrons and how they work because they're most important in terms of bonding. Um, we have sodium here with a configuration of 2-8-1 and as always guys have your reference tables out. Um, chlorine has 2-8-7 as its configuration and what happens here we look at the valence electrons sodium having one valence electron and chlorine having seven we've discussed in class on um, the desire for them to achieve stable octets or to be like the guys in group 18 over here all right so what happens when sodium transfers that valence electron to chlorine sodium has a configuration now of 2-8 and chlorine has a configuration now of 2-8 dash eight okay now they both have noble gas configurations the sodium ion na plus is now like neon which is a noble gas and 288 is a configuration now of argon now word of warning chlorine did not become argon he just has his configuration there's a term for that called isoelectronic we'll talk about that later but now chlorine ion has a configuration of argon and the sodium ion has a configuration of neon. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have charges now because positive charge formed by loss of electrons, the negative charge formed by gain of electrons. What happens now? They are able to attract. Okay? And if you read the homework packet, they had a term aggregation. That's a nice term. There's a coming together or packing together of particles. And this is what you have over here in terms of a crystal lattice okay and we'll talk about this crystal lattice so notice there's positive and negative charges now they're, they're not just paired up together positive and negative all the positive and all the negatives they're attracting uh, towards each other so it's it's more widespread than it looks okay so that makes the bonding very very strong which we'll talk about in our next slide Okay, properties of ionic bonding. Um, they tend to be strong. Um, the compounds tend to be hard and brittle. They tend to be electrolytes, and they don't form molecules. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as we discussed in class before, if you have strong bonding, strong attraction, what's going to happen is in terms of your melting and boiling points is that they will be high. Now, MPT is my shorthand for melting point, and BPT is my shorthand for boiling point. So if you have strong bonding, it'll be hard to separate the particles, so you will have high melting and boiling points. Now the classic uh, mining compound for us will be sodium chloride, but please don't, ladies and gentlemen, don't think sodium chloride is the only ionic compound. There's um, a large number of them, so any type of ionic compound can be considered salt. Some are you can ingest and they're good for you, and some you you're, are not so much are actually toxic, so you have to be careful with that. Okay, um, the term brittle, we have to be careful of that also because it makes it sound like if they're just very fragile. But what that simply means is if you um, smack it, hit it, um, it doesn't tend to bend it into some nice shape. It will actually fracture, okay, and uh, that's, the term, that's the term brittle there. All right, in terms of electrolytes, we've discussed electrolytes in class. We did a simple demonstration in class, so we'll talk about that in our next slide. And in terms of not forming molecules, okay, we, they have a crystal lattice. Once again, that term aggregation of positive and negative charge together, so they don't have independent molecules floating around. Okay. Electrolytes. Electrolytes conduct electricity in what phases, guys? In the molten 
and the aqueous phase. Okay, and we discussed what both of those mean already. Molten simply means melted, so therefore it's going to be in liquid form, right? Okay, and aqueous means dissolved in, yes, water. Okay, now over here in this picture, I have a crystal lattice right here. Okay, but if you notice what's happening over here, guys, the water molecules are surrounding the ions of the crystal lattice and pulling it apart. Okay, there's a positive ion right there in the center, and there's a positive, negative ion over here being pulled apart from the crystal lattice. Now, when the water molecules pull the ions apart, guys, the ions now have mobility. So we have mobile charge, okay? And those are the two key things, mobility and charge, that are needed to bring about conduction of electricity, okay? So when we did our test in class, we saw that our sodium chloride that we used, when we made it aqueous, it was able to conduct electricity. It let the light bulb up, okay? So we're going to move on. Now, in terms of covalent bonding, covalent bonds tend to share electrons, okay? They tend to be soft in nature, and they tend to be have weak intermolecular attraction. Now, I put an asterisk over here. I mean in terms of relative to ionic bonding. So, if in a comparison of um, covalent ionic bonding, Covalent bondings, intermolecular attraction will be weaker, and they'll tend to be softer. And as a real-world um, memory device, you can think about sugar as your classic covalent compound. Okay, and um, if you, as I asked of you before to try it, put two of these guys in a pan, put some sugar in a pan, put some um, sodium chloride in the same pan, and heat it up, and you see which one um, melts first. It will be the sugar, so always have, have that as a memory device. Um, covalent compounds, for the most part, tend to be non-electrolytes, except which one, which thing, which covalent compounds not an electrolyte, guys? Yes, and that would be acids, okay? And acids are found on what table? Mm -hmm. They're found on table K. All right, so we see over here in this picture we have chlorine, we have protons in the nucleus, they're just showing the valence electrons on the outside. Now these protons have an attraction for these electrons here. Likewise, the protons in the nucleus of the other chlorine have attraction for electrons in right here. Okay, so they're pulling these electrons right here, they're sharing them, but they're pulling towards themselves mutually in, each, in opposite directions. Okay, and in this case they're sharing now what happens is we have seven X's, right, it's representing the seven valence electrons of chlorine. One more, that little circle right there, seven plus one gives him eight. He's achieved a stable octet. Likewise, this guy has seven circles, as you see over here. Seven circles plus one X gives him eight. And from his perspective, he's happy, he's now stable. So they're helping each other out in a sense. Alrighty, so we're moving on. Now, in terms of covalent compounds, right, the reason why many of them tend to be non-electrolytes is the fact that when you dissolve them, for example, you dissolve some sugar, they produce, right, neutral molecules, all right, in solution. They tend to give you neutral molecules. Now, they have mobility here, all right, they're mobile, mobile, okay, and that's good. In terms of actually having any charge, they don't, they're neutral, so they will not light your bulb up for you. So that's why anytime you're asked in terms of how come something is um, a non-electrolyte, you simply say that you know it provides no mobile charge, there's no mobile charge involved, unlike something that's ionic, which provides mobile charge in solution. Okay. We're moving on to metallic bonding. We did metallic bonding in class. Now that seems to have got hidden in, in a lot of people's notes, so we're going to review it a bit more slowly. Metallic bonding is sort of unique. It, um, it occurs in any individual metal. So, for example, if you have aluminum, if you have uh, copper, if you have any metal, magnesium, for example, all of these guys will exhibit metallic bonding. And 
as is stated here, they have free electrons, specifically the valence electrons, which are located in your outer shell. They are able to they are able to move around. Okay, so if you have moving electrons, electrons have a negative charge. Okay, that's mobile charge also, and this picture right here nicely illustrates that. You have mobile valence electrons, and we use the term delocalized. Delocalized, not local, but being all over the place. Okay, in these pictures right here, I have um, put here, these, this mobile charge is able to produce certain properties for metals. And if you're able to pull metals into wire, what's that called, guys? Okay, that's called being ductile, right? Okay. Um, in terms of if you're, able to, if you're able to hammer something into shapes, that's called being... malleable right okay and shine okay we call that l word we call that luster and in addition okay metals are also very very good conductors of heat and electricity and other forms of energy so those are things that we're supposed to know if you know something is malleable or luster if for example if they ask a question and they state this substance is malleable automatically in your head you should be thinking about metals and metallic bonding now I want to stress this to once more people I'm going back to the beginning we have to get very 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 familiar with our reference tables guys we gotta know metals from non-metals from semi-metals once again in the blue right here are our metals okay the yellow represents our non-metals and this funny color right here, this reddish burgundy color, will be our semi-metals or metallized. If you don't know your metals from your non-metals, life will be miserable, guys. So we want to just study those guys, make sure we know them. If it's a metal, non-metal, it's ionic. If it's non-metal only, it will be covalent. All right, so we did metallic bonding. And our last one will be network solids. Now, in terms of network solids, I told you to think classically of a diamond and its properties there's also silicon carbide that's a network solid okay and there's also graphite which is in our pencils now i use the analogy of scaffolding i know we've seen scaffolding um, around construction sites there's a certain interconnectivity all around okay in scaffolding which makes it very very stable very very strong Okay, so in terms, of, in terms of network solids, think of the arrangements of the bonds as a type of scaffolding, which makes it have very, very, very strong bonds. And if you have very, very strong bonds, you know your melting point, your MPT, and your BPT will be very, very, yes, will be very high. Um, network solids like silicon carbide and others are used in industrial um, tools, okay, and... Um, also, they use diamonds to cut other things, and they use diamonds to cut diamonds. So it's, it's still kind of weird, but that's actually what happens. So network solids are very, very hard. You'd expect them to have very, very low solubility. And if you try to do conduction with network solids, for example, you try to do conduction of electricity with diamond, um, it would not be very successful because it's very fixed and very rigid. And once again, you need mobile charge to conduct electricity. So that's a brief... Um, Introduction to the uh, four types of bonding that we're going to have on our quiz. We have ionic, covalent, metallic, and network solids. Um, I hope this video was a help. And as always, hard work plus sacrifice equals success. And um, once again, please, please study that beats anything else. And I'll see you guys later. All right, take care.